Hello, Clemens. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Um, um, I got your name through Marvin Bratke. I don't know if you guys know each other personally or if you have worked uh, together maybe because um, I, I saw a, bit, a little bit of your background and uh, I saw that you are also you've been working at graft uh, where he also was uh, and he told me about your work and i i went through it and it was very interesting so you can introduce yourself and say what you do to the people that are watching to this podcast yeah hello my name is uh, clement sitzman i am at the moment uh, a freelancing architect and designer um i have a very I, my architecture background i'm trained architect. I got my architecture training mostly in Vienna, um, where I also graduated from an art school uh, in architecture. And I've been working in design departments of various offices since, yeah, let's say, six, seven years. And also including quite some in Germany, especially Graft. I want to highlight it was a very um, inspirational office in Germany and where in Germany the building code is quite um, is quite tough so there are um, it, it, it's also interesting which architecture offices want to push the design uh, quite far and I've yeah worked at Graft I think for close, almost three years in the design department where also yeah I met uh, Marvin Bratke we worked in a team together and um, yeah, then afterwards I was in the design department of another um, bigger office of Locker Partners in Berlin. And actually with Corona, I think it was that I, I had the urge to get um, independent or freelancer, basically. Um, that had two rules. One, I was, I mean, two, two reasons. One, I was in design departments of, you know, architecture offices for quite some time and my portfolio of projects um, is, I'm quite happy with it. And so for me, the question was, do I, I mean, basically I was working more on, you know, schematic design, a little bit of design development. And then I decided to, yeah, maybe it's time to, you know, take a step back uh, to reflect and, you know, to see what other, um, things are out there that you can do as an architect um, and one reason was also that i i mean i have also quite a um, um, you know somewhat a visualization background and which i mean that's actually how i got into architecture first and and, and, and i sort of but um and then i started developing so you, some, so you were um, you were first doing some visualizations and then decided to study architecture <clears throat> no, uh, not exactly. I mean, so I come from a fairly technical high school where I learned uh, AutoCAD and then I got um, a summer job in uh, my hometown in South Tyrol at a company that does, you know, iron products um, and stainless steel and so on. And they tasked me to do their whole inventory in 3D in AutoCAD. Um, which yeah was was fun. Uh, I loved doing it. I loved working in 3D. This was before university. <clears throat> oh, actually, and and then one day I came across um, because I was supposed to do renderings. I came across 3D Studio Max Five uh, back in the days. It was still not owned by Autodesk, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I can create everything anything that I want um, and so I was totally hooked on it and um, I studied political sciences before architecture actually and then I decided I was looking where can I do this 3D modeling things yeah and so I was like yeah I think architecture would be quite nice so I started doing architecture on the side with while studying political sciences and pretty quickly found out that hey this is a lot more fun this is a lot more tangible i can i can you know create something of my own world and yeah i'm very happy about it about that decision i i was wondering are you uh, austrian or are you german because i don't know that i'm i'm technically neither because i come from south tyrol 
which um, I mean, I still have German language, German heritage, uh, mostly or Austrian, but technically I'm Italian. Yes. I'm oh, okay. Northern you Italy. have an Italian passport. Yes. Oh, so we have another Italian on the podcast because I also was born in Bulgaria, but I grew up in Italy and I have an Italian passport too. Uh, and uh, really? I, was, I was wondering because I saw your education is mainly, mainly in Austria and I was thinking maybe you are um, Austrian because we have never had a person from Austria on the podcast. I was thinking maybe finally, because I really like to have like from every possible nation and from every possible continent. Yeah. Um, but it's um it, yeah it sounds interesting your background and it's so fun that so much i mean i've never met anyone that uh yeah there were some people that are more mostly now in the architectural visualization uh business that have started like you just with the uh first with the softwares and then they um they 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 studied architecture and and then they went back to architectural visualization and and you mentioned you are working now as a freelancer um was the pandemic also something that uh, pushed you to uh, get out of the so to say regular job in the architectural field um i believe so yeah i would say so because in during corona <clears throat> A lot of things that you had, you know, alongside your normal job, um, you know, fall apart because you couldn't do them anymore. And so everything was kind of, you know, I mean, your your job uh, that you had, uh, your work was, uh, you know, getting very or even more so important. And I think this is um, a lot of colleagues had some, you know, you had like time to reflect what you really want to do. Um, you had basically a lot, a lot of time to think. And I mean, for me, this process also led that I um, that I want to take something of a you know break from what I used to do, like being a design architect in design departments and 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 being heavily invested in computational design, which um, the computational design I'm still very invested in, but I was yeah looking for let's say some new challenges or also looking a bit at the world outside of architecture and, um, and the pandemic for me also had a really good offered a really good opportunity uh, because i got a, a teaching position that i could teach from uh, remote basically from berlin and um, so you're based in berlin and you're teaching um, in another university as i might understand uh, correct. Yes, I live in Berlin, um, but I teach together with my good friend Victoria Sandor. Um, we studied at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna together, we are colleagues, and she is a uh, um, teacher and instructor at the University of Innsbruck at the Institute of Structure and Design. So we um, were teaching um, or still are teaching a bachelor design studio together and yeah yeah no go ahead sorry no go ahead i mean go ahead ah. like you were teaching a bachelor in and <clears throat> at the university uh bachelor yeah. design studio yes and um so it's like a one-year course i mean based, based on two semesters and it's our second year now um i yeah that, that also led to i mean the redis rediscoverment of you know academia and being more creative than you know a normal architecture job is and where i can also use more of my let's say you know i have a very somewhat an artistic background so i can use more of my knowledge in that ways and um, that i couldn't use so often but totally understandable in you know sometimes the everyday architecture um, job so yeah it was quite a good push also mentally and also it it, it let's say it also was a really nice addition to have you know be, be i mean i'm also very happy to 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 work in you know the let's say the real world and but and then also having something back in the academia and and to to be part of those discussions i i thought it's very fruitful and i'm very thankful for that opportunity yeah we we've been talking a lot on this podcast about this uh, topic that um it's important somehow to keep the theoretical conversation also uh, alive 
because once you move to the real world work from the university you get only to do like stuff that are really project related that are really like uh yeah related to how much budget there is on a certain project and how much time you have to spend on it and they just want to you to deliver as many possible designs usually i mean i don't know how is that the offices you have been but basically it's not there is so there is not um, a lot of this time that you have at the university just to think about like theory and um yeah like uh, ethics of architecture and design and and this is important and also i guess it when you teach someone else uh I don't know if you've ever seen this uh, pyr pyramid of learning that um, like the highest level of learning is when you actually teach someone else how to do um, like there is learning about something, try to put it into practice and then there is teaching someone else. So it has teaching uh, somehow give you new energy and new knowledge uh, since you started? Um, I would say definitely, definitely. And I agree with what you said. Um, so for me, I also had the problem of, I, I have been to, you know, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna is very known for, you know, very uh, quite cutting edge and avant-garde design. And for us, this was the daily bread, yeah. Um, we were all worked very hard on it and very, we were all very ambitious. And, you know, there was a really good surrounding of professors and instructors. I mean, like Zaha Hadid was teaching there. I was in Studio Hani Rashid. Uh, Greg, Greg Lynn also has a master class there. So it, it was very, I mean, it was like an absolute turbocharger. But at the same time, I would say it was kind of a bit of a problem for me because I was quite good in school. And then you think this transition smoothless uh, to the, you know, the real world. And, and then, I mean, I also was super lucky. I got to work at Asymptote Architecture in New York straight after my graduation because my professor, I mean, Hani Rashid uh, um, hired me. And so I was, I had a nice transition, but even working for, you know, quite a cutting edge design studio, you really realize like, hey, when, when reality hits, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite tough. Yeah. It, it's not how university teaches you to, to do the projects. Yeah. Um, you know, you have suddenly have to deal with all these real world constraints and you have to get used to, especially when you've been in this, you know, artistic cloud of projects. I mean, all our projects were really like uh, aiming for the most, I don't know, massive highest, you know, concept. Yeah, they were all really on the borderline of, you know, what you can do as an architect somehow. I mean, my, yeah, my, my thesis project was basically a library, the contemporary version of the library of Alexandria. Yeah, I had to make a space if, if that could host like 20, 200 million books. Yeah, and, and so it was all, this was a bit the, how the projects were, and I totally loved it. Um, is that to see somewhere reality, online? Is maybe that available on your website or something like that? That is on my website, and I think I even made an extra website for that. It's called um, Logium. Okay, uh, I'll try to probably edit it into this point so that when you talk about it, people also can um, yeah. can uh, can see what your what what was it the modern version of the library of uh, Alexandria because it sounds really interesting as a project as a master master thesis and um, yeah I, I, I agree with you like um, and I mean I see your work it's all like very very um, how do you say like it's definitely avant-garde uh, even from the professional world uh, what were your observation what were those constraints that you uh, got hit by that were a little bit uh, I don't know I don't know if shocking is the right way, word or surprising or unexpected I mean yeah there were that's a really good question um, there were definitely quite some tough pills to swallow yeah that, that I mean first and foremost I mean I was very good in software so I you know in software you can do everything yeah so so there are no limits and i always loved that and then in reality you know you have to tailor to so many different needs i mean architecture is such a wide field there's the client with the client expectations they of course want something i mean you're spending somebody else's money and you're spending a lot of it so you know there also comes somewhat a very big responsibility 
and then there is a thing yeah i mean you, you, architecture you cannot <clears throat> you cannot design everything 100 percent. like you really need to pick your fights and you really need to pick your focus because um um you know you you cannot work against structure structural concepts yeah you need to be very smart in what fights you pick and also i th i believe in in how you communicate your design because what we never got taught is we all thought to be you know basically super great designers and yeah we can t talk about this design in a very you know architectural way but i could not communicate this very easily to my friends yeah i mean to some yes to some not <clears throat> and so the reality was yeah i mean there are so many constraints that you have to take into account and it's which at the same time is also interesting it's basically a multi-dimensional riddle and it's very hard and this is also i think why i still you know liked it um but basically there are certain rules that you that are there for reasons and there are certain rules that you know you know you might want to bend a bit yeah i'm still always aiming for you know to me personally um architecture is derived mostly from form um, um i i i'm very honest with that um since these are the spaces that, that you know we we, we 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 inhabit and then you know of course comes mater materiality and anything but so for me this i always had a quite of strong sculptural and formal approach um yeah, but so that's also, your, you know, hard to do. What is your design philosophy? I've um, I've learned on this podcast this concept. Um, there was uh, this industrial designer Scott Henderson. Uh, he was he does very interesting works and 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 he he explained when the, he was studying industrial design and the questions that he was receiving a lot by his teachers uh, was what is your uh, design philosophy? And his design philosophy was. He um, looks it as a, uh, always on the positive. Um, he has a positive approach that I really enjoyed, and he thinks always, "What can I do that it's gonna surprise the the user?" Like um, usually, designers think, uh, "What can I do to solve a problem?" He he says more like, "How can I excite the user or the the person that's gonna experience my design?" What are the ways to surprise them to yeah to positively surprise them and you mentioned something about uh, like there are many approach for example my personal approach towards architecture i like a lot the the, the danish school the school of young girl when you think about uh, people uh, how to design spaces for people based on maybe activity that then somehow um, shapes the architecture do you have a concept about how you because when i see your portfolio when i see all your works that you have done uh, they're very um very of course uh, avant-garde very uh, also as you said with very advanced tools i can see there is a lot of parametric architecture and they're not you cannot say you have like a certain style you have like um so i want to say what is your approach because the outcome the output it's very various yeah i yes uh, that's a really good question also um i mean my opinion i mean yes i would say i am driven by form mostly and i'm, I'm a very in love with like forms that i haven't really um, got to know yet um also i need to say my designs change quite a lot you know i mean my there's my university design work and then there's my professional design work and 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 <clears throat> It doesn't need to be over designed or, or you know crazy or, or something but it needs to be very smart so in my opinion um if i, I tackle a design project yeah um like in, a, in an office i also wanna you know i mean there are these obvious things these key parameters that need to work yeah if you do an office building you know there are certain things that just need to work really really well but then it's the thing i mean to me i mean i personally make a big difference between you know making a building and architecture yeah because an engineer can also make a building he can make up you know as it has this area has a staircase and so on but and this is unfortunately the truth that um everything gets so oversimplified nowadays and my design philosophy is that i always look about, about these things that you cannot really quantify in, in, in all these excel sheets yeah which is really the surplus value of usability of encounters you know of of 
and, and here also form comes in like i want to create something that that it's not that hasn't been there yet and that doesn't need to be spectacular but you know the, the subtle things you know how public space is shaped how interactions are shaped how you know how you give different touch points for different users in whatever building i think this is really this underlying dna and this, this intelligence of, of of design um um even more so than you know the, the formal aspect but you some but very often form is really the 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 um you know the helper for for these things yeah i mean the, the highlight spaces they they guide you you know unconsciously like to to spaces and and in my personal opinion it is like the, the gonna be some more fan like it needs to be a little bit more fantasy and and, and because we have so many arbitrary spaces and i go from one normative space to the next to the next and and it, it's really i mean we are building our nature like everything is, you know people made this and this and that everything yeah i mean people planted this tree like there is not real in my courtyard there's not real in my hometown there's still a lot of real nature but architecture and our cities we said this is human you know, built nature yeah and so it really matters how it looks like it matters how it is structured it matters the hierarchies yeah it really matters how citizens and people interact with each other and also if you give them the opportunities to do so yeah definitely when i arrived in germany there were like uh, people that had this sticker on on their laptop when they were studying architecture and the sticker was saying in German, architecture is where wo du bist. So, so it means architect, architect, architecture is where you are. And I thought it was a super smart sticker to have <laughs> because it's, it's so true. Um, and I agree with you that um, architecture is this um, extra power that you bring to the buildings, you know, this extra value, the added value, because if you needed to, to do just a building you could engineer it but there is a need of architecture and it's proven through the past of architecture that too much rationality in architecture uh, it's not good it doesn't bring to good results because um, there is this also dichotomy of the relationship between architecture and the people like we make our environment and then our environment changes us so if you make an environment that it's unpleasant and, and and makes you unhappy to be there then you get angry frustrated so it's um it's really important to to do good design um you mentioned in the beginning that you have been uh, studying this uh, this technical school and you have this technical background and i can see that also in your design you can see that there is like two souls in in your background one is very technical and one is designer uh, what are, how do you combine the technical side and the tech side of, of architecture and design? And you mentioned also you are very familiar with lots of softwares. What are your tools? What is your workflow? What softwares do you use nowadays? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, so I mean, I started from a technical university in Vienna for my first four years and then there were some particular instructors which were uh, annoying me with their comments and i also was you know was hungry for more so i went to the art school uh, for the angewandte so i i have luckily um you know a good uh, technical background you know when it comes to you know what you know how to properly draw plans sections etc but then at the same time also you know architecture discourse you know different school you know different theories styles etc and on and there's a lot of software i i taught myself basically via tutorials which back days back in the days were not on youtube but uh, yeah were a bit harder to get but um i mean the long story short is basically i always wanted to be something like a one-man army and so i always was like working on my weak spot and uh, you know when i didn't know how to do this well i i you know tried to put some you know focus points there and so yeah which 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 and, and it, it's always interesting how things you learn also affect your 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 design yeah i mean technical technical knowledge influences you know your, your drawings 
certain software packages, parametric design influences your design again. And so it, it's like this sphere that's constantly rotating somehow. Um, and I have to say, for me, definitely all the 3D software, I'm still, uh, I mean, I'm a, 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 you know, computational design is really one of my, my, my you know, key, let's say, key performances. So I always was able to, I always wanted to be able to articulate any idea that I have in either 3D uh, visuals, etc. So because this was a way of, you know, like sketching for me. I'm, I, I'm not really good at hand sketches. And I always was like, you know, while working in these different software platforms, you know, the, 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 I always also tried to push them and and which was quite cool um, to you know do stuff that they're not really meant to but it's i always find it quite an inspiration and, and being you know fairly experimental and um yeah so so i always wanted to have the full platform i, I didn't want to have like i can do this or this but like i i wanted uh, everything yeah and then and, and what are the different like you started from autocad uh, 3ds max uh, then I guess, uh, what do you do? Like Grasshopper, Rhino, a lot of this stuff. You have also uh, very beautiful renderings. Uh, so yeah, if, you, yeah. if you can go more in detail, what is like your uh, um, arsenal nowadays? <laughs> because yeah. you, you definitely need <laughs> yeah. an, ar uh, an army of one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my, my software arsenal, I started with AutoCAD, like 3D modeling, yeah, and then uh, with 3D Max 5, I started uh, rendering. And then I went to architecture school, so I learned a little bit of ArchiCAD, which I never found pleasant because it's already so defining what is a wall. I like, I rather want to sculpt like clay and, and, and be very free in what I do. I, I started with Cinema 4D, I believe. I did a lot of Cinema 4D back in the days. Um, then I think at one point I started learning Rhino and with Rhino also then started using Grasshopper and um, yeah, I was trying to push Grasshopper a bit and uh, very luckily one of my videos uh, got part of the uh, Rhino 6 official promo, which I was super happy about because I made Grasshopper do something that was not really meant to do, like some forward kinematic system. And so, yeah, I was quite into Grasshopper. And at Angewandt, uh, I mean, also 3D Studio Max, I use for modeling and rendering a lot, uh, sketching, yeah, um, making quick massing sketches and so on. Then the render engine was mostly V-Ray I was using because I also, yeah, for a, some time I was work, also working at a visualization office in Vienna. Um, so that, um, yeah, taught me quite a lot. Um, we had really cool projects to visualize a lot of Copimil Blau projects. Uh, it was quite fun. And yeah, other stuff that I work, I really love uh, Nuke. That's a compositing tool that's um, actually more for, you know, kind of feature films, but it's a super good platform for, you know, spherical rendering, animation that, you know, if you want to do some, some, you know, very let's say some smart stuff or like that's very hard to do in after effects i, I was was a big fan of this um, this tool um what else am i using uh, at the moment i'm a blender i started using a little bit but um yeah i think mostly everything nowadays i i'm covered in rhino and 3d studio max i mean they usually can get to 95 percent of what i do uh, okay, so like maybe doing all the parametric stuff in Rhino and then put them in 3ds Max and do a nice rendering. Um, I can imagine. Um, yeah. No, definitely a lot of the things you do they look really cool. Um, and um, well, you like one thing that it was also very interesting to me is that you um, you have done different things a part of architecture that are like. Um, as I said, you can very much see through through your work the different uh, backgrounds, experiences joining together. From from your background, you can see all these um, um, these different backgrounds that have influenced you. And uh, one thing that you, you do different kind of works, not only architecture. You can see that probably it's coming from 
your sort of more uh, art oriented uh, um, also experience in Vienna. And uh, you've started a very big collection of NFTs, uh, which and if, I've talked also a lot about NFTs and, and Web3 and so on on the podcast because it was interesting to explore the, um, the knowledge of different people that know more than me and what is the future, uh, mm. if this is just, uh, just some images or if it's something more, more than that. And I was wondering, uh, what is your experience with that? And how did you decide that you wanted to start it? Yeah, I mean, so so um, how I started it was mostly, I mean, I do I, I I did you know visualizations and then I somewhat developed something of a workflow that I call it's my drawing engine that I can create graphics very very super quick in a very abstract style. I mean, like some are like this that are here on, on, on my shelf. And so this was, I was doing this on the side of architecture, like to be happy, to be very open, to express myself in form and geometry. And I then when the whole blockchain came around, I was like, great. Now, finally, I, maybe I could use this because my work is like very driven by algorithm. Maybe I can use this to, um, yeah, make something like a certificate of authenticity. Yeah, And that was even before the NFTs. And then... When NFTs came around, I was like, great. I mean, this is exactly what, what you know, digital art needs. Um, and so from the first, um, you know, excitement, and then I pretty quickly had to realize how, what kind of, you know, what's this art style that, that's really trendy on NFTs. And being someone who's trained a bit in, you know, maybe the traditional form of art, I found the artistic value of a lot of projects um, not very striking. And I was working on some drawings, a set of drawings with more some more geometry, uh, like it was basically boxy geometry. And then I was like, wait, I mean, this would be actually perfect to do an NFT collection um, because a, it's a very good series. Yeah, I mean, they all have certain boundary conditions. They are all from a cube derived and so on. And so I was like, yeah, cool. I mean, this looks going to be a nice collection. And so I decided to make, I think it's 253 parts. I decided to make them into um, NFTs. And it was, I mean, in the beginning, I also was, you know, maybe aiming for some colorfulness. But then I was like, no, 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 it needs to be very abstract, black and white, uh, realistic. And the interesting thing was when I was done, <clears throat> I was uploading them all manually. I'm not a programmer, so I have to manu manually enter everything. And the interesting thing was, in my opinion, that NFTs have these properties. And then when I was like, okay, I'm done, but now I need all these properties. So I made a big grasshopper script that you know encodes all the properties in the in the in the in the incomplete cubes. Uh, that's the name of the series, the collection. And so I said, like, this is actually quite nice because I can think about. It's all this, you know, everything is driven just by form, like just how my mentality is a little bit. And every form has different, you know, values. Like, do they touch the boundary uh, vertices? Is, is the center of gravity in the middle, above, or the bottom? How many edges does it have? Um, and so it was, I found this a really cool process for me to really give this, each of these NFTs, like their, their set of properties. And most of them have like five different properties. And it's beautiful because on OpenSea, you can click around the properties and you can filter them super quickly. And, and I thought this is a nice asset that NFTs have that you, because I want to talk more about form. Uh, so, so this was for me a vehicle to, you know, bring something to this NFT world in that, that is really, it's not about all this colorful, I don't know, animal pictures, but it's really super abstract architecture, sculptural, and you can yeah, have the properties and also can download it as a printable um, 3D file. So I, uh, this was kind of the side project of my side project, but I'm very happy with the, with the outcome. It was no, quite fun. It's, it's very interesting, but I didn't understand this thing with the property. So the properties are like the, the property using Grasshopper in order to make them uh and also but they are they like the are the cubes some fruit of this algorithm 
or is every cube uh, manually made by you and then you add the properties that you used in order to make it i didn't understand this part very well mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question so i generated them manually yeah they are basically intersections of multiple um, you know profiles and so on yeah um so they were they were um it, which is still a, quite a generative process but it, even if it's done manually and once i was done i was very happy how they look and then then i realized okay they need for a collection i need all these properties so i made a, a script and then actually um, in retrospective you know I, I analyzed all of the geometries that i created for and then i set certain conditions yeah? and then it made me a text list about this cube has this 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 yeah and uh, that was quite um, interesting to do this afterwards somehow because in a normal nft collection you do this before um so yeah it was this kind of post you, you had to be very analytical about the geometry and what kind of you know values you wanna you wanna create a property about and okay i get it now and then basically you encrypted it into the nft so to say every single in the properties of the nft correct yes i mean when you upload it you need to you know you have the file and then you have the 3d file that you can that's unlockable material and the properties um i mean on normal collections there is a script that does that for you i had to do this um copy pasting by hand from a really long excel file um but yeah this is then part of the nft and once you freeze the metadata it's really literally baked on the blockchain so you cannot change the properties and um, it's basically uh, final and set in you know not stone but in the blockchain and um yeah then everything is you know basically the, all the information is in the block and it cannot be changed and yeah this can then go on from user to user and um do the cubes have different um it when i was saw this project was really fun for me uh because uh, my first uh ex, like in the university in rome the first more or less design uh, design uh, task that they had was um, for our we had a whole exam about architectural representation and the concept was to do um, an artwork for the venice biennale uh, with a cube so how to how to do a cube uh, we had a cube i don't know measurements 20 by 20 by 20 and we had to do uh, something within this cube and i remember i built these edges that were touching all the edges and um, um, vertexes of the like they were like some planes that didn't look like a cube but if you it looked like a bunch of spikes uh, but if you would put it it would like mm -hmm. And you could see the the cube only if you had if you looked it in certain uh, positions. You could see the square, so to say. Um, so it remind me of that. And uh, does your composition have also some sort of of um, back meaning because they're very different, very they variate a lot, or it's just uh, because um, the collection name is called Incomplete Cubes. That's why I wanted to to ask you if it has a certain meaning. Yeah. Yeah, so the backstory of it is um, um, I'm a very big fan of uh, Sol Le Witt. And uh, once also at university or at my exchange semester at SciArc in Los Angeles, I worked with friends on the Incomplete Cube series. Um, now, Open inco Incomplete Open Cubes, I believe, is the right name of uh, Sol Le Witt's um, series, which was a mathematical analysis of a cube. Yeah, so how how many different cubes are if there is one stick how many are when there are two sticks how many when there are three sticks till all the edges are covered and i found it like super conceptually super genius and so this was been always a bit on my back burner and then i kind of wanted to create something that that's very you know that's in a cube not really thinking about solar wits work and so on but then I started intersecting these profiles and then trying to basically create these funnily odd looking cubes. 
And, and then I was like, I mean, the process is not similar, but I named it Incomplete Cubes as a homage to, to uh, Solowit uh, Incomplete Open Cube series, because that was, I think it's still a very genius artwork. And mine, uh, they work differently. They work very differently, um, although they have a somewhat a similar look. And, and I was like, I mean, for me also the visual metaphor of being a cube, you know, a cube for the blockchain, is quite a, I thought it's quite a nice uh, visual analogy, somewhat from the aesthetics. No, they definitely look really cool. And, you, and um, how many of those have you sold? And, and when they get sold, do they disappear um, from the internet, so to say, what is concerns your side? Or um, how do you, how does it work when somebody buys a cube? Um, yeah, I mean, so the collection is basically done since a while, but it's, I haven't really sent it around public. So, I mean, some friends of mine and uh, my brother also bought one. So I have, I think I have like six, seven sales for now, but haven't done any advertisement or marketing for it. I mean, I think at one point I will do that, but I think I need some, um, you know, exterior help for that because I don't have time to do that. Um, but how does it work? I mean, everything is minted on like, a the Polygon blockchain, which doesn't consume energy and gas fees, which I think it's really, I, I, I'm not uh, necessarily a big fan of the whole NFT um, art culture because A, it's, it's very um, resource, or not very resourceful. And uh, it also, I mean, why do you want to pay nowadays in 2022, there's an, uh, the climate crisis and you pay 70 euros that's really energy expenses for graphics card that one somewhere in in the world i mean that's really beyond me and and this is a bit the dark um yeah the dark part of, part of it so i made it on a blockchain that that doesn't cost anything and doesn't consume almost no energy um and but the interesting thing is and this is why the traditional art market is a bit different than the nft art market and if somebody buys that like my brother bought one nft it's in his wallet um and from his wallet it can go to the next yeah and so the interesting <laughs> the interesting part of it is that you know it's everything is like a tree yeah if there is some secondary market you see where each one spread it's basically like a family tree at one point you could reconstruct where your artworks went which is quite nice i think it's a nice feature to have um, and don't you get also like a little um fee again when the artwork is reselled I, I think this is also something that nft is very good for the artist or am i wrong uh, that is correct um you can you get a certain percentage for a resale um which should be also in the traditional art market but it's too easy to not do that um the interesting part of the nfts is it's encoded in the smart contract so there is no way around it you will get your a certain percentage that you you set for yourself um yeah so this is i think this is more important for people who flip nfts and so on um yeah, yeah. no definitely i saw recently because i was thinking to do nfts with the cover of the podcast episodes and give them sort of a i don't know a property to access access um, an exclusive part of the community or something um but i was also wondering about it because of the whole environmental um, problems that are mm, yeah linked to the cryptocurrencies and nft and so on so i think that um, this has to be somehow made more efficient because Mm, the energy that is um, used for that, it's extremely high. I, I saw like one video from uh, Chris Precht, the Austrian architect, who was considering doing some artwork and turning it into NFT. And then he explained um, all the data and the numbers. And um, I was like, mm, that's a little bit too much. I mean, I still like the concept of NFT, but um, yeah, I want to wait that it's more like, I don't know, I have to consider it too because it has this other dark side, as you as you said yourself. Yeah, but there's an important point to be made because NFT is not NFT. Yeah? The NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain, they at the moment, because everything is proof of work, um, require a lot of energy. 
And this is, in my opinion, very resort, uh, um, wasteful. And I think this is also what uh, Chris Brecht uh, was talking about. Um, however, at the moment, there are also a lot of other blockchains where NFTs can be minted. So written on the blockchains that are super energy efficient, um, like the, the, the energy that you, you know, but again, this comes on, on the security, but it's still so secure um, that, that, you know, doing this extra heavy computation is not worth uh, doing, in my opinion. And so there are some like Solana or Polygon. Yeah. Polygon works on Ethereum, but it works just way, way more efficient. There are ways around this and to, the, the, it's, it's, it's not so hard to make an NFT, um, let's say, not wasteful. But I think still a lot of people use the Ethereum blockchain because usually you get higher in margins for that. Um, higher prices but i think that's bogus yeah i don't i don't know i, I yeah I, I have so that polygon has not this um has in these gas fees that might sometimes have can be so high that it actually the gas fee are more than the artwork itself um which is also tricky so of course it's i don't know it's still like the beginning of the um, uh, revolution so to say the next wave of the web 3.0 and I think it's just the um, tip of the iceberg what we're seeing so far. Um, and I'm curious to see how it's going to evolve. But I definitely was um, impressed by by the work you 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 have done. How many you said they are? Because there are like so many variations, like more than 200? It's 253 uh, versions, which by the standard of an NFT collection is rather small, actually. I mean, a lot of collections are thousand upwards, but they are then algorithmically generated and not uh, manually uploaded and, and uh, with all the properties. Um, Is there, a, uh, did you pick this number 253 for a reason? And uh, no, uh, this has just happened when I started intersecting all the possible options. And so this was then the outcome. Ah, this okay. Is truly derived by um, how many I cross combined. I see, I see. Now that's. Um... No, definitely a very interesting um, collection, and and uh, to put them because they can be found on OpenSea. One thing that I'm also curious is like, um, do you need to pay some money to make it an NFT, or there are no fees in order to to mint it? Um, no, there are no fees to mint it um, on the Polygon. That uh, certainly not. Um, and there are also no fees to buy them, yeah, because some, sometimes you can, you could even, OpenSea has this policy that, you know, even on Ethereum, you could mint it for free, but then the buyer has to pay the, you know, the gas fees, which I think is, uh, I think is wasteful. And so, yeah, Polygon is really, in my opinion, a really good blockchain to, to do this work on, which is very sustainable and not wasteful and also you know, doesn't cost any gas fees. So I think that's a, yeah, it's a no. solid. Uh, totally. Option. And how many of those, like, um, um, was this um, more like a fun side project or did it have some economical impact on, on your, on your life, so to say? Um, no, it was definitely a fun project. I mean, it was really, I wanted to work on, 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 I mean, I basically, I basically what I really wanted to do is to really make an uh, NFT collection that has something of an artistic background somehow. That's, you know, not, I mean, I'm a very big fan of, you know, abstract expressionism and so on. So I was really, I really wanted to make something of like a counter, a counter concept to this, this, you know, the usual, colorful profile picture nfts which i think it's it's i don't know i think it's really uh, a bit bogus how much people are willing to pay uh, for um i don't know a, a ape photo just because of it resembles i mean this is really um, um yeah it's, it's a world i don't fully understand i also don't fully comprehend but um i wanted basically to yeah but this is a bit um, maybe maybe um, how to say selfish, but I really wanted to bring some something artistic on the blockchain too. Yeah, that's that's very architectural, that's very tactic. You know that that is, is form and geometry rather than than I don't know some I don't know ridiculous looking things. No, it is also yeah. That's 
Um, I don't know why do they have these aesthetics uh, of the Web 3.0 that it's, I don't know, it's not uh, what the designers found uh, find aesthetically pleasant, so to say. It's um, a little bit um, a different kind of aesthetic, so to say. But I think it's a very nice concept, the one you use with the cube and everything happens within this cube. Uh, thank you. It's in, in the end, it's a little bit like the designy pixel because <laughs> all these uh, shapes that you have inside uh, can be also be interpreted as um, as pixelated mm -hmm. and an, another thing that uh, has um, so to say caught my eye from your work is that uh, you've done also a, a series of uh, uh, wallpapers uh, how did that happen how um, did you get this assignment and uh, what kind of impact has that had on your personal life? Um, yeah, so the, 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 the collection for the wallpapers is an interesting story because I, as I said, I developed myself this kind of drawing engine. And the one uh, thing from that is, is I can render any resolution. I, I don't have an insane computer, but I can render uh, 30,000 by 30,000 pixel um, in very like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on the geometry, because the, it's just a very different kind of calculation it needs to do. And so I was like, because I always was very stunned on this Google Maps images where you can zoom in and it's infinite detail. Like, I love it. Like everything super huge. Um, and I wanted to create something similar like this. And with this drawing engine, I, I, yeah, I put a lot of geometry in it and some artworks on Instagram are made. I mean, almost actually all of them, close to all of them are made with this technique. Um, of, of obviously, the real scale is a lot bigger than the one on Instagram. And then I thought like, wow, this is, I mean, I don't know anybody else who can do this easily. So I was like, yeah, I mean, I, I need to make some use of it. And then I started working with some algorithms. Um, that's yeah, quite some years ago that I, I, I used some algorithms to basically create geometry. I mean, like this is one of them that got created like this. It's basically a super, um, it's a non-repeat pattern. It, it, it's, it looks like a fractal, but it's not a fractal. Yeah, it's self-repeating somewhat, but it is, you can extend it till infinity. It will never repeat once, yeah. Um, but Unlike a fractal, you can also not zoom in, in into it infinitely because this basically, um, you know, defines geometry. And so I was like, okay, I have, I have this render engine that can, you know, calculate everything in really quick. And then on the other hand, I have this algorithm that can create this up to infinite detail. And so I was like, yeah, I, I need to use, uh, make some use of it. And Actually, then the contact to this company, um, like I always want to do really big drawings. And, and I mean, on one exhibition, I also had a two by five meter banner with one of the motives. So scale was always a bit on my yeah, mind. But since I'm an architect, I also thought, you know, why not? I mean, why not, you know, go a bit into project, uh, product development. And so, like two years ago, like an actually an interior designer, ex-girlfriend of mine, and um, she got in contact with um, this uh, Berlin uh, company that they do wallpapers and they set us in touch. And so, yeah, we talked about a bit my motives and my yeah, drawings and yeah, it was an interesting process. Um, we, 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 we picked then six of them. But the whole process actually was a lot, um, took a lot longer than we thought. It took a year and, 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 and um, we thought it takes like a couple of months. But um, I'm yeah, very pleased with the output. Um, the collection went online as an artist series, um, or the first artist series on extratapete.de or .com maybe. Um, so yeah, it was very, fun to design something that you know people could potentially hang in their rooms and this can change the you know the atmosphere of the rooms um or you know probably some are more suited for offices or restaurants um given the the visual style but i wanted to bring something of this this unknown forms 
and these patterns that also I haven't seen uh, yet um, out there, yeah, because um, everything that you construct costs a lot of money, but it's fairly economic to put stuff on a flat plane on a wall or something, yeah, has quite an impact. And so it's a bit, I don't know, yeah, makes it easier accessible, which, you know, architecture is, is still. Yeah. Um, very and the one thing, it's like the, these geometries, they have to be also, you mentioned that um, they can never repeat, but um, don't they have to have like certain patterns so that when you put them on the wall and then you put the next one, um, they sort of like don't um, have this, what is it called? They don't get shifted, that it looks seamless. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good question. Um, at the moment, they are rendered in a high resolution that you can do 3 meter and 20 by 2 meter and 80. Um, uh, so they basically um, take one extremely big uh, uh, image and they cut it. So it the image is correct. Right. Correct. Yes, they cut it. They cut it down, and the full resolution was um, thirty-two thousand by twenty-eight thousand pixel. Um, so it was quite heavy, um, but also needs to be this detailed. And the interesting thing is, not I mean, from this series of six. Um, the flat ones, they, they, I, I, I found a way how I could make it them seamlessly blend into, I don't know, eternity uh, via a script. It's a lot of, uh, but you know, you basically move everything and then you render it and then you stitch it together. You could get a very smoothless and endless um, loop or, or extend uh, in, in all directions. Uh, the ones which are a little bit tilted, that's doable too, but a lot harder. I mean, um, so the potential is there that this, you know, extends a lot beyond the three meter and uh, twenty in width. Mm. And um, I'm out of curiosity, what kind of computer do you have? Because I'm pretty sure everybody are wondering by now. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you the computer that I have right now. It's uh, actually six, seven years old. I bought it still back when I was living in New York. I brought it to Europe. It has a uh, Intel 5830 X with, I think, 12 cores, 32 gigs of RAM, and I upgraded the graphic cards to a 1080 Ti some years ago. Um, so there is really nothing too fancy. Um, but I'm really considering buying a new computer now because I think I need some. I, there, there's been a lot of development and I need to um, get a really good graphics card and a lot more um, um, yeah, RAM speicher. Okay. So um, RAM yeah, it's time to upgrade. No, definitely in the computer the field these seven years are like uh, 70 years probably. Uh, is, was it a big investment to buy such a computer back then? Because I know, like from from some rendering people, I know that it's several thousand euros to buy a computer. That yeah, I mean, I mean, this is very surprising to me because back then, without a graphics card, it was like a thousand dollars. So it was not insane. Um, but I also my my computation is very efficient, so I don't need a super crazy computer because I don't do like. I don't really do, you know, the normal rendering anymore with the year every once in a while. Yeah. So it's really doing quite well. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the, one of the issues was more the bottleneck was more the, 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 the RAM. Yeah. That 32 gigs are not enough. And I can tell you maybe what the computer I'm planning to buy now. Um, yeah, go ahead. By planning to buy now is um, it's a Ryzen, the 5950X, um, 128 gigabyte of RAM, and um, a 3090 RTX graphics card. Or maybe I wait till the 4000 series of NVIDIA is out because um, I think that will be quite a bit of a game changer. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, but at the end of the day, I also need to say my computer is old, but it, it, it's still working quite fast in a way and it, it's not um if you optimize everything well you, you can do quite a lot i mean obviously that depends on the processes you are using but um it, it 
on, on everything, it's more about the user than, than the equipment they're working on. That's um, especially students are always very interested in what software or what uh, computer you use, but uh, that's really just a tool. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, but it's. Um... I think it's easy. It's it's something interesting just because um, it's a complex topic. So if you like, it's not that if somebody buys the same computer as you would, they would have your skills. <laughs> That's not how it works. It's like, uh, um, but it's easier like to have an you have an understanding what what do you need in order to have a good tool for that thing? I yeah, see it that yeah. way. I mean, basically, what I can recommend everybody who works with computational um, stuff, don't buy a really a, a gaming laptop or something, buy a proper desktop computer. They're just very easy to handle. You can upgrade components easily. And um, to your point, yeah, I mean, definitely to have a solid workstation is important. Um, this is really, I mean, I use it every day. I actually should have upgraded it a long time ago because um, you, you only know how good something of nowadays is when you, when you have it. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think it's good to to really have some some if you work with computational 3D design, scripting, etc. That's computationally intensive. Get yourself something proper. Um, it, it will be worth it. It depends on your, you know, there's a sweet spot of, you know, how much, you know, euros you invest to the computation you get out. And um... yeah, there is like this um, point at which it's not worth it anymore because you're not going to get the value for the money. Uh, so like, like with everything, if you invest too much into something, then at some point it's not, um, not worth it anymore, the return. Um, so yeah, um, no, but it's definitely mm -hmm. interesting. I think, as you said, probably it's more worthy yeah. to focus on the skill to have a very efficient, uh, computation, but what do you mean by yeah. very efficient and computation? Like how you set up the materials or so on? Um, yes. I mean, to, 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 to finish the story with, with how people work, because you know, Victor Enrich, this render, um, person who was, he's still very famous with it is, you know, really beautiful looking, perfectly modeled um, um, buildings. And then he did a twist to them. I mean, he's really insanely cool guy. And I've been to a lecture of him uh, back in Vienna and he models with AutoCAD uh, 2000 or uh, with AutoCAD. Like it takes him, he models this crazy German with AutoCAD. And I was like, so stunned that somebody, I mean, of course it takes really a long time, but that somebody achieved this with modeling in 3D AutoCAD, which is the most, in my opinion, not not really the best uh, use for 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 um, 3D modeling, but he pulled it off and it looks better than my stuff. So I'm always very you know, uh, you can do kind of everything with with uh, depending how much you and, wanna. Um, and and he and does. Then, um, what is he called again? Victor Enrich. Uh, I believe. I have never, I've never heard of of him. Uh, you might have seen his images. I'm pretty sure you have seen the images because they were quite all over the internet and um, they are of, of exceptional quality. Yeah, I can only. Um, um, so what I, I'm, I'm finding some images of a guy that's called like uh, it's a painter. Ah, I'm probably you mean those images of these towers that are bended and then they open up like Correct, flowers. Yes, exactly. Uh, OK, but on Instagram, he's called Victor. Torres or something like that. I don't know if it's out of fun or Torres. Okay, then. Um, uh, for uh, yeah, no, he no. he. But he's a he has done also a lot of paintings. I see. And so basically, he does he does images, so to say. He's architect, but he does a different form of um, visual mm -hmm. art, so to say. No, definitely very interesting. Well, that's a good tip. Maybe maybe I can try to contact him and. Uh, talk about <laughs> how he uses um... yeah, it's really cool it was very uh, we was very passionate about his work and how, how why he still has his very not so efficient workflow um and for my workflow what you asked uh yeah my drawing engine is super efficient because there's not really a light calculation or a traditional calculation um per se it's 
everything is related to geometry. So this is um, not very intense, um, mm. which is good. But um, like the amount of geometry can sometimes get very, very heavy. Um, yeah, that, that's a, at the moment more the bottleneck. But, um, uh, and but again, always can go faster. I mean, with the new computer, I will still think like, why did I stick with my old one for so long? I'm sure. Yeah. No, definitely. But I, I mean, like for me, it was also quite hard to get an, like to understand when somebody tells you that it's just a tool in the beginning. I say, yeah, yeah, it's just a tool. But why do you have this tool? And in the end, it's really like you say, you have to really um, mm, it's more on you and not on the like I know people that do stuff with the laptop and until you like um, you have to learn to work with what you have at your disposal and then maybe upgrade afterwards because if you upgrade it's like um you start to play football in the first league it's too different difficult no so you have to start from lower levels and then upgrade with when you really think that your skills have reached a point where your is the gear that is stopping you and not um and not yourself this is how i see it yeah, I think you're totally right. And coming back to the to the issue of, or not to the issue, to the topic of software. I mean, I think both is true because I also, if I'm very honest, my a lot of architecture projects of mine were also, you know, emphasized because of some tooling that I did, yeah, or that I was able to do, yeah. So suddenly there's this script, suddenly there is this problem. You can make this kind of facade, and so there is. It's really both your tool really allows yourself to do a lot of stuff. It also controls you and, and you can definitely do more with this tool than without it. Um, so yeah, um, um, I can do a lot of procedural design or procedural computation with the tools that I have. At the same time, I know some people who do this in Houdini, they are able to do a lot, lot more, yeah, which I, at one point I will reach a limit where I cannot go beyond this in Grasshopper or this other plugins that I'm using. Um, so, so I mean, still the question of what tools and what software somebody uses are super valid, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, because it's really, um, that's also, I, I learned stuff because I was like, this looks cool. How do you do it? Or where do you do it? Because I didn't know. Yeah. And so there are certain sets of software where, where you can do um, certain things. Um, yeah, so I think maybe to the to the topic of tooling i think it's also good to have a certain range of tools to allow yourself a certain freedom so you're not constrained to one um that's something that i would advise um you know everybody in architecture a bit you don't want to be limited somehow as a designer necessarily yeah yeah no definitely but this is exactly for example you got you know yourself that you have reached a point where you you have to jump on the next thing in order to maybe level up a little bit and you know already basically and the mm -hmm. misunderstanding that a lot of people have is that they can skip all the steps in between uh, let's say somebody sees one of your projects and says oh if i buy this computer with this software i'll be able to do this no you have to start first um, being uh, comfortable with not being good <laughs> in the beginning uh, and uh, level up on your skills and then when you have the level of knowledge to say okay I have a limit in my gear I could do this but I need this other software or this other computer in order to be able to do this at the speed I need and then that's where when you feel this constraint of your gear then it's where you need to jump on the next gear not first invest thousands of euros in um in the gear um this is my opinion yeah. because i have had this problem yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but this is a very in interesting topic because for me it was also i i used to be really good in v-ray I, I my render times are super low and the, the output is really really well um also in terms of quality when you know how to master the settings yeah somehow which was you know quite quite some wisdom 
and then suddenly all the GPU rendering came out and you could do unbiased renderings, but you need to have a very good machine, you know, I don't know, Redshift, Corona, um, what all there is nowadays, um, Octane, F-Storm, I mean, the render engines like uh, more than ever before. And I mean, I was very in the beginning of, archi of my architecture um, study, I was very into photorealistic images. Yeah, how to create the best photorealistic image. That was really one, one of my goals. And then when the whole, when I thought like it gets so easy to make a photorealistic image. And I also lost interest in being very descriptive and accurate. So I kind of went the other way around because I didn't, you know, at the end of the day, then you needed to have the best graphics card and not just one, but three. In a computer to make a super kickass rendering uh, in no time and i was first and foremost not interested anymore in photo re realism really as a, as a way of depicting geometry and form um, but rather more in i i always was was into drawings into architectural drawings i mean what wes jones did or brian kentley from from eula or onymorphosis drawings they were all very you know abstraction is beautiful because you don't show everything yeah, you show just something that then the, the picture gets completed in, 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 you know, the viewer's mind. And so for me, the way was completely another one because everybody was going super high tech, high tech, high tech. And I was branching out, really going really, really back because what I'm rendering is basically something that's super basic. I just have very smart um, um, shaders that are really built from bottom up. Yeah, there's no... I don't know, reflection or, or something, you know, that's to come. It, it's really form in the essence, like there's no, nothing such a slide, but, uh, and, and what I, I find very beautiful is um, kind of nobody knows what, how I do it. Yeah. Um, and I think so, it's really nice to be able to make these drawings in, in the way that I do, um, because it's something that I, you know, kind of develop this workflow, I developed myself. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the only one who, who, who uses this, but I think it's, it's for me, I found it like kind of the perfect platform because I can, um, yeah, drop geometry in it and, and create this abstract drawing-like uh, renderings in an insane resolution. I mean, that's that uh, makes me very, very happy. Um, yeah, there is like um, on YouTube uh, a little bit um, back in the days I found uh, there were this, um, you know, the V-Ray company, Cows, Cows Group, House Group, uh, they have organized something like called the uh, House Days or something similar where different speakers would speak about uh, Arquivis and and there were also there was also one architect, a Bulgarian guy. Uh, he has this office called uh, One O, like the Matrix One O. Um, and um, he said something really funny during his presentation because uh, apparently it was a row of presentations. And he says like, it's so funny that the people that do renderings try to do them as realistic as possible, and architects try to design the architecture as non like they want to achieve some result that it's uh, actually not realistic. So we have to have this. Uh, lines and this transparency and this there is this sort of um, uh, poetics in architecture that tries to uh, give form to something abstract uh, but the people that does the visualization mm -hmm. they try to make it super real so it was uh, really funny yeah, to yeah. <laughs> to see the the approach of the two sides like uh, that uh, the architect tries to really like when you design you have this a clean line and maybe this clean line is not buildable through the material so you have to find a way to make it look like it was on your drawings and um, that was something that made me think yeah that's really uh, ironic uh, that is how it works yeah that's an interesting topic because also um you know what is really realistic anyhow yeah i mean people if you render something photorealistic that's not really photorealistic but people believe it you know like i mean people have an assumption how the real color of the sky is or how the, or how, or how you know how green grass is and that's not necessarily what really a photo of reality would be but the concept of reality that they are used to seeing and so yeah i think the discrepancy of how 
you show architecture in a visualization versus the reality is, is quite a quite an interesting one um because i also remember when you do real photorealistic renderings you need to make all these little imperfections that make it look more real yeah even though in reality you would want it to make it you know perfectly flash yeah so. that's something that i always say that uh, nowadays renderings look so much more beautiful than actually they look more beautiful than reality because in reality you get all these imperfections that you don't have in the renderings or these um, sort of imperfections that has um, um, they had to be there through I don't know some constraints of certain norms like I don't know for example you have to have some alarm stuff in your facade or there will be some certain dirt or you have to have some sig signaletics for safety and stuff like that that maybe it there's so many details that sometimes they get omitted in the renderings and the, the buildings looks more beautiful in in the detail in the um, in the unbuilt world and so i yeah, I yeah. Get that. Or, or leave a lot of columns out because yeah or leave the columns out uh, but I, I i don't know i don't know if uh at grafts architects they let you do that but uh the german offices i've worked at <laughs> they always say no 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 you have to put the the pillar because the people <laughs> that is gonna buy the building they <laughs> will see that there is no pillar but then at the end there is some and i was like well, yeah but we have to sell it first <laughs> yeah yeah no that, that's a good um, question i cannot go too much into details how that was a graph <laughs> uh, i don't want to give anything away but uh, obviously you know you you for um you know very ambitious architecture you don't want to you know um, um you know you don't need need to show everything all the time how it will really finish but you also need to you know communicate the idea and and yeah there's also the saying that um our great architecture begins with a lie um which is you know um the eiffel tower is only erected for the world expo and then we take it down yeah i mean uh, imagine saying that now uh, and likewise for you know the El Philharmony, obviously everybody knew you cannot make the world's best acoustics um, um, for you know I don't know what was the 100 million I mean that's ridiculous uh, low um, everybody knew it was gonna cost some more but of course you need to start low otherwise you will never build it and um, that's a bit the unfortunate truth um, not saying it should have cost definitely less than it has because there was uh, quite a bit a lot of uh, um, um, mess ups on the construction side, um, um, but at least they got a beautiful opera house. And 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 you know, in Berlin we got uh, we paid like I don't know two billion for an airport that looks like uh, ridiculously dated and like from a, from a, I don't know a second big city somewhere in in, in I don't know somewhere. It it's not looks like a capital airport. It looks ridiculous and costs a lot of money. So. They at least have you could you could make two elf harmonies with that money that they invested in this um yeah no definitely. Design airport. but sometimes the cost of construction uh also are exploding through side problems not the design like mostly is the politicians <laughs> or the people that are actually in charge of the money that <laughs> make some of that money disappear <laughs> So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's, it's really everything is about coordination. And if you have uh, the more faster you coordinate a, a construction site, the more money you're able to save. And also, I mean, also people forget that, you know, building a building is not the biggest cost, but maintaining a building over its uh, over its lifetime. That's the cost impact. Um, but yeah. Uh, Big problem, big projects. Um, you know, sometimes you have problems that you cannot avoid, or you know, maybe there's an issue at the. Um, you know, you you find something in the ground, and and then yeah, um, it, it's it, it, it's also like making a building or especially making big buildings. It's um, it's not everything is always perfectly controllable. That's um, the reality. No, definitely, but um, I, I, I I agree that f for sure that um, we have to invest, as we said in the beginning, into this um, more interesting architecture to the to the user, 
and not only build always the same thing um but to yeah. to go back to to the like i'm always very like um i i like um to translate what we talk just so in in we have a lot of lectures in our field we have a lot of places where you can go and hear uh wise things from people that know a lot more um but i'm curious also like in the end to inspire people to to do what you do for example or to understand more a little bit on the practical side how you can put yourself in the position you are um so to sum up nowadays after i have having this uh, back background you have that it's very rich and uh, cl clearly you have worked hard through your education and it's also probably your uh, natural drive to to work a lot on design um how um how what is your setup so you you have this teaching gig that you have gotten uh and if you can get more information about how you have had the opportunity to get it and what are your other flows of income like the nfts i guess this um uh paper wall if he get if it gets sold so you get maybe some percentage or something so in order to to people to understand okay what i need to what are some possibilities that i can do as a freelance architect in mm -hmm. order to maintain maintain myself because in the end of the day nice renderings nice nfts nice, nice paper walls and everything but <laughs> when the rent comes at the end of the month we have to to pay it if you can share more like i don't need to know more details just like to un to understand yeah. what this and how your daily life looks like also like uh, if you have to work 12 hours a day or what is your routine how that affects the personal life maybe if uh, as yeah, much yeah. as you want to share mm -hmm. yeah i think um um i mean at the moment i work as a freelance um designer uh, i work also for a architecture startup um kind of close to full time at the moment i mean speaking of hours i'm i'm um at the moment i'm helping them with a project that's a modular wooden construction it's the urban beta like where marvin is also a founder and marvin bratke and yeah i do the teaching uh, which requires one day a week um so the other days i you at the moment work for the for this architecture startup um speaking of yeah the, the i mean with the nfts and and the and and the and the wallpapers they i mean they they have something like a passive income on the side um that's not but they are like they, they will not make it i think it's personally very hard to live just from stuff like this um you need to be very savvy with you know i don't know marketing getting into the right people which i'm very much more on the creating side so i, I would um be very happy about uh, yeah knowing more about this marketing and everything um but this is really the i mean this is a bit the the, the, the fun stuff yeah that, that 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 you can do on the side i mean um i think it's i think it's um good to experiment and good to try out stuff and good to 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 you know try to build something on the side i mean like as an architect we are all very smart and, 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 you know, we have got a very good um, education. We can do a lot of stuff. We cannot just do architecture, yeah? So um, I think it's it's really good not to forget it. And I, for me, it was, I really wanted to create geometry and form that I cannot create in an everyday architecture job um, so easily because here I can really go myself, let go myself. And if something comes around from it, um, it's great, yeah? Um, I also, print my works on metal and and I, I have no online shop yet but i will i will make one but um, i'm always very happy when friends of mine ask or want to buy one piece um, so that makes me i mean uh, it, it, the financial benefit is is not um, huge yeah but but uh, emotional and, and you know it's very motivating when 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 people have an artwork of yours in their flat and they're uh, super happy with it and, and say how how nice it is to have i mean that that's that's so valuable to me and more than more than the money um yeah obviously it would be interesting uh, um to to 
yeah, to make your hobby your job, but at the same time, it's also a bit dangerous when you need to to earn the money with it. Yeah, so to pay your rent, as you said, it um, that's a whole other challenge. So I think it's good to be have something that you have a you know fixed income somewhat, and then some stuff that you you know can do on the side. If there something comes out of it, really great. But otherwise, it's also fun. So that's that would be my advice. And um, another thing that I was thinking is that you told us you've been to um, New York, uh, you studied in Vienna, um, now you are in Berlin. There are three very, very important cities on the world stage of design and culture. Uh, what are your impressions from the three? Are they very different uh, cities to live in? Uh, very, or there are similarities? Uh, was there something shocking to you when you went to New York? Like to everybody going to New York sounds very romantic, you know, to go there and be a designer. Yeah, I mean, all the cities are very, very different. And I also was very lucky to do an exchange semester in Los Angeles, which was on top of it, also very different. So I'm, I'm quite happy that I was also quite lucky and I'm very grateful for that. And I think, yeah, exploring cities is really, for me, it was always a big um, step up in my, I don't know, personal development. Because um, um, to, to really get new routes somewhere is always interesting to build up something new. Um, speaking of the different cities, I mean, every city has the benefits and, 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 and the negative sides. Yeah, um, Vienna was very boring. I never, I mean, I lived there for eight, nine years. I mean, not boring, but it was very finished. Yeah, everything looked similar. Everything is nice. Everything is done, but there's nothing, no element of surprise, really. Um, while in New York, when I moved there, I was like, wow, it's a super big city. Um, always stuff going on, always new stuff. But at the same time, I realized, hey, I mean, I suddenly now have, um, I need to work really a lot. I have, um, and everybody works really a lot. People don't really are used to enjoying their lives. Um, like it, it's, the hustle is quite strong. And I was like, mm, my life quality isn't really so amazing here. I mean, the job was great. I'm very thankful that Hani um, invited me to work at this office. Um, yeah, and uh, Berlin, that's where I am now for six years. I mean, the architecture in Germany is really challenging. I mean, they are very aiming very low, most offices. Uh, they also don't really have ambition in terms of, you know, developing something that is, you know, future-proof architecture or, 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 or and, and then the biggest problem is, so Berlin has so much empty space, not so much anymore, but it's beautiful. I mean, finally, there's something that's not built, like there's literally dirt. Yeah, there's not even a park, like in Vienna, unheard of, yeah, or in New York. But so this unfinishedness of Berlin is so beautiful, in my opinion, as an architect, besides having then different decades and centuries of city building. Yeah, there was the wall cutting through the to the to the center of the city. You have, you have the Frankfurt Allee, which is huge. Then you have the, you know, kind of, you know, Gründerzeithäuser, you know, very dense. Then you have the Plattenbauten. Uh, then you have all kinds of stuff like socialist modernism. Then you have, you know, Hansa Theater where they try to, you know, outdo each other in architecture. So it, it's like really, it's really a bit like like a super weird mix of, of city planning uh, that's totally unorganized, but I love it. It's beautiful. And and so speaking of German architecture, I mean, Berlin is really great as a city, but the architecture scene is very challenging because there's so many rules. And that's also why every, but everything looks so boring. And this is a bit, um, as much as I love, love the city, being an architect here is quite, um, challenging because they have just a different architecture culture in 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 the Austrian architecture culture in my opinion this is that that raised me is is a lot more we want to create something new when i give something new to the people we want to be innovative yeah and here a lot of officers say hey we built this many square meters last year and you're like yeah great is that a sign of quality or something like it's really not i mean that, that's really very strange parameters to measure your success as an architect, in my opinion. Um, 
but um, yeah, I would like more experimental work from my colleagues in Berlin. Um, but I also need to acknowledge it's very, very hard to do experimental architecture in Germany. And it's not just the fault of the architects, um, but also the system. You know, you have a very quite rigid system of rules. And if you're out of outside these rules, then you can get easy into trouble. So it's a little... Yeah, uh, but I have to say it's also a little bit... Uh the people that uh, give you the commissions because they don't want to like in the end of the day the final decision for the uh, how far somebody wants to go it's the client like if the client always focuses um i can speak um for frankfurt because this is where i have my background and most of the clients they see architecture purely as a um as an economical asset so they would build whatever just for considering they build something they make money out of it and their goal is not to build the future or to build something different um, or to have this extra value we've been talking about which architects bring it's more like yeah let's do so many square meters with this shape with this window with these materials with this layout and um, we know it works and it's so inter interesting to me as somebody that hasn't grown up here because in the meantime, we have the car industry in Germany and Stuttgart and and BMW and everything. And that goes so like, like I hope now with the electric car, they can keep up because there are talks that maybe through simplifying everything in the car industry that will be a very big damage to Germany. But in the end of the day, also the design of the cars has been always like very cutting edge in Germany and then architecture is so traditional, as you said. Something very interesting. Yeah, it's very in interesting. I mean, but at the same time, same stuff I could say about Italy. I mean, Italian design is one of the best in the world when it comes to furniture, uh, clothing, etc. They are like a handful of really cutting edge uh, Italian architects. Yeah, I mean they are all very happy in their old houses, um, but in in terms of object scale, they are very design uh, savvy. Yeah, um, so yeah, in Germany it's it's with the car culture that uh, and, and the architecture is a bit different. Um, I think it's also duty of the architects to convey the surplus value of proper design of good design, rather than hey, ob obviously you can have here your your, I don't know, I mean, sometimes it's really like a money-making machine with some architects built. There is an area with the same window or 300 times around, but there is no soul in it, yeah? And and this is really, I'm, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Bjarke Engels, really not, but I mean, he does a really good job of communicating the surplus value of architectural, of good architectural design, because you get your square meters, but you get a lot more on top of it, yeah? This is really what architects need to be very smart about and communicate this, this extra assets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can do it like this, but we can do it like this, you get the same, maybe break one, two rules, but then you, you know, look at this, you get a very beautiful quartet with a view or, or you know, something that's really thinky. And, and yeah, but he does the very good skill to not only combine communication alone, but to actually like give them the square meters. <laughs> I think that's super important. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you, you, definitely. Yeah, I mean, but this is this is also good design. You know, you need to be you need to be good at both because you cannot just say, "Hey, I'm a genius. Uh, look at my beautiful design," and and, and it, it's really not um, within the the, the the interest of the clients. Yeah, I mean, that the client gives you usually quite a lot of money, and and you know, you cannot go against it completely. Obviously, um, you can. You know, try to, to facilitate it in, in some one way or another, and, and you go in a certain direction, but you're still, um, yeah, um, working for him. Yeah, so it's really, but it's also about, you know, how well you communicate certain as aspects, maybe, and also how, you know, how open a client is to to architecture, and rather than just making, what's what are his real interests? Is it making money? Is it making a nice? A development does you wanna you know the the whole range is there yeah m money is king but of course like i was talking also to i had on the podcast um 
uh, Metin Van Seil. Uh, he is one of the uh, founders and partners of this uh, Dutch studio called Studio Nine Dots. I don't know if you have ever heard of it, but they do this pretty nice architecture. And I was asking him, okay, how do you sell this stuff to, to your clients? And he was explaining this, this. If you do something nice, the value of the building, like the if you want the the value of the real estate is just higher. And if you have like property properties that are next to something nice, also those properties value will get higher. So this is also one, for example, one thing that you have to communicate. Um, and I've been recently to Copenhagen and I had the chance to look at a lot of architecture And it was really interesting how uh, the buildings, the, a lot of buildings, like also somewhere that you wouldn't expect, um, are built in a way that they invite the user to to use it in a certain way or to maybe there are certain areas where they uh, somehow the design tells the user here is a place or an area where you can do, can can really get free as a user too. And um, in in the meanwhile, I got um, the opportunity to talk with some of the people to of the local architectural scene. And for example, Bjork Ingels is very hated, I have to say, on there, which I don't understand why. Like I I I, I visited some of uh, of uh, his projects that he has built, and um, yeah, I don't know. There is some stuff that are more nice on the pictures and on the drawings as in real life, but. For example, I went on the eighth house, and of course the critique is that um, it's a huge building. But that was the the brief of the competition, and 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 it was nice to walk on the ramps and to see how people pull their bike up the ramp, and you could see here and there like footballs that kids had lost or just kick out of their balcony, and then they went down, and it 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 felt it works, and then the like the like sometimes uh, i don't know i think that people uh, shouldn't uh, focus so much on hating someone um like if you don't like Bjork Ingels if you don't like Zaha Hadid uh work uh learn try to put yourself out there um try to make a different work uh, try to find a client it's a very complex thing and and regarding italy i couldn't agree more i think italy is great at marketing and there is this um um design events that create this aura now, now there is the salone del mobile in milan and all the design media are focused on on milan and all the archi stars go there and there is all this built beauty from the past and there are so many architects that are talented that leave the country i had so many people from italy on the podcast that i didn't know And I don't have them on because they're Italian. It's just because when I go to the different offices where I want to or different fields, um, like I didn't know the chief design officer of PepsiCo. That's this huge uh, company that does um, um, does uh, Pepsi and all the stuff, all the packaging. That The head of design is Italian, but he had to leave Italy. And I think there the problem is systemic. It's like the talents go abroad And now the most advanced things that they do, they have to call again Bjork Ingels or they have to call um, what um, Herzog and de Meuron and there are all the, uh, yeah. of, like, there are just a couple of offices like, uh, I don't know, um, Stefano Boeri, for example, that did the Bosco Verticale. But the yeah. working conditions in Italy, like if you want to go for, To work for that office they they won't be as good as if you go abroad like working for one of the most boring german offices give you better working conditions than than working for stefano Boeri. and that means rather than go do some nice like yeah you you can do it in the beginning but as you said in the beginning at some point reality hits and then you understand that um it's also about your personal life i think This is the sad reality about yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. I, mean, I also had my, my fair share of 100-hour weeks, uh, uh, which is really not fun and you sh nobody should really do it. Um, and, and, and yeah, this is the downside of it. I mean, architecture is still, 
uh, architecture need to adopt its business model a little bit because it, it, it cannot rely on so much extra work. It's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a sustainable system. I mean, you also need to be, um, and this is a bit the, 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 I know offices who invest a lot in design, um, that's not where most money is to be made. Um, and so, of course, you need to be able to finance that somehow, yeah. And, you know, of course, so people, you know, especially in, not, not everywhere, but especially like, like this design is a bit, you know, underpaid, you have a lot of hours, it's quite demanding and challenging. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I also think it's good to maybe do it for a little bit and to work on interesting offices, but at the end of the day, working conditions are really important. Um, and you know, it's for your mental health and your physical health. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is everybody's decision to be made and how, where they want to focus and yeah. No, I, 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 I agree. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I, for example, I'm like totally for, um, yes, the business model, it is what it is, but also there we have to face the reality that um, when it comes to build architecture, at some point, it cannot be like the Sagrada Familia. You cannot build it forever. You have to like, you have clients and you have to make yeah. it happen in a certain deadline because it has to be also economically sustainable. And that involves uh, at some point have these hectic, hectic moments where you just need to push through and, and do the stuff that needs to be done in the time it needs to be put extra. Uh, so that uh, it's like, I don't know if somebody has ever watched there were these beautiful uh, documentaries on the National Geographic called, called Mega Structures. And also there were some on, on like uh, mega buildings and they show like, they, they show how cool, like they make it look cool that people work hard um, to make these great buildings happen and then they happen. Um, but what makes me angry is when I see like, you know, maybe the, as you said, there are not so many um, architecture offices out there, for example, in Italy. And then the few that they are there out there, they don't give you the, the working conditions that you would like to have to, in order to say, okay, I work extra, but it's worth it because maybe I get extra holiday, I get proper contract, I get proper payment. And they say, no, mm. we just don't give a shit because there are hundred other people that are ready to do this job and yeah yeah but yeah, yeah. yeah so i'm like uh, i'm like no I like do your own office at this point like start you like you're gonna earn bad and work these extra hours do it for i don't know six months one year to learn and then go for it on yourself instead of working for someone else in these crazy hours yeah, I think that's also a good point to get independent at one point and try it. You can always go back. Yeah, like, um, or do something on the side always to keep yourself trained. And, and um, yeah, this is my uh, opinion on, on like uh, many people do like you do that they try to, uh, yeah, to, what does it say, to... Um, to find a teaching um, job because that's more maybe like less time uh, intensive as working in an architecture office and then do architecture because this is also mm. or there are um, I don't know sometimes there are some sort of like uh, programs that are research programs I mean if you have a will you find a way like uh, I've heard so many cases like in in 100 episodes that like uh, this is now what they say all, all roads lead to Rome means that there are many ways to do one thing like there is no book mm -hmm. yeah that's correct yeah. Um, well Clemens I think uh, we got through a lot of topics and it was nice to to have you and I don't want to uh, take away much more of your evening um, I always like try to conclude on a very positive note and um, to create this sort of um, I call it the think tank of inspiration so every guest uh, in the end can leave some some of their things that they like to read uh, if you have some book that you really enjoy or some uh, movie podcast plays sport uh, hobby 
something that uh, you have enjoyed when you had a, a dip or something like that? Um, let me think about it. I mean, I cannot wholeheartedly recommend books or shows or so. What I can recommend is to look at art. Um, art, I mean, a good take is, you know, um, American abstract expressionism, abstract art, minimal art, land art, um, Russian suprematist art, you know, it's, everything is very architectural somehow. And the thing is really, I mean, for me, art is, is like visual philosophy. Yeah? You can look at it and you get the concept. And so it's very fruitful in my opinion. That's, that's why, where I derive my most, I don't know, inspiration also somehow. Yeah, I've never sh I never shared it on a podcast, but my inspirational, um, like inspirational um, habit is when I really need to get inspired again. I go to a museum. The museum is like, uh, no matter what museum you go, like if you go to a museum, um, you see the, all this uh, artwork, and, and you think, oh, there are people that have done this, and I want to do something nice too. And this is how I get, for example, recharge my inspiration batteries yeah good choice uh well yeah. clements thank you very much for being on the show uh, i'll put all the links in the description so you guys can find all the contact to clements and to his artwork and um, you can go check it out check get your cube nft <laughs> and um, yeah thank you clement all right thank you have a good evening you too.